This is George Newbern, the voice of Superman, and you're listening to the DCAU Review, hosted by Cal and Liam, streaming at DCAUReview.com and on your favorite podcast app. There is an alien among us. A superior being from a place called Krypton. Deep in the heart of the city, he watches for signs of danger. Ready to act on a moment's notice. His true name is Kal-El. You know him as Superman. Maybe you ladies haven't heard about me. The future of Metropolis is in the hands of the Man of Steel. Get up. He's gonna be busy. I said get up. Superman. Welcome, everyone, to episode 237 of the DCAU Review. I am Liam, and with me, as he always is, is Cal. Cal, the hits just keep on coming. We just had our Black Friday episode released yesterday, and here we are the very next day with another episode. As promised last week, our final uh, Superman the Animated Series entry for the time being as we uh, look to close out November. That's right. And uh, speaking of that Black Friday episode, assuming that you're listening to this on the day that it's released, as opposed to, you know, sometime in the future, 50 years from now, whenever now is, <laughs> which actually, in that case, you can still listen to our Black Friday episode. Be sure to check that out. We uh, we had a great time discussing uh, five of our wackiest Kenner Batman, the animated series figures. Uh, definitely take a look at that. A lot of fun and uh, something we like to do. We like to usually drop something toy or or video game we did last uh, in our prior calendar year. Mm-hmm. Um, just a lot of fun. Something to bring the, the childhood nostalgia back of the uh, kickoff of the holiday season. So definitely check that out. But yes, we are, uh, as we mentioned several times already this month, and uh, in in past months of covering Superman, the animated series, there's a lot less to cover when it comes to Superman. And uh, as we'll discuss on this this episode here, we uh, we are at episode 237. We started reviewing Superman, the animated series episodes back on episode 11 of the podcast. <laughs> so we've had a lot in between there. And there's there's less than 60 episodes, I believe, of Superman. So mm-hmm. uh, we have a finite amount of, of content, but obviously superman is such a huge important part to uh, to the the dcau as a whole he's your favorite superhero um mm-hmm. you know he's he's a lot of people's favorite superheroes so we want to we want to not leave the superman the animated series in the dust and and we want to be able to still enjoy some of the content so uh we introduced a, a, a this year this calendar year we introduced doing these Uh, character spotlight episodes and as we discussed Mm -hmm. on our episode last week we were going to take advantage of this saturday being a uh, a holiday weekend and roll one of those uh, character spotlight episodes out and we are focusing on one of if not maybe the most recognizable at least when it comes to this series villains uh, specifically Superman rogues, you know, you might think mm-hmm. dark side, but uh, you know, I see dark side as a, as a DC villain, you know, he was mm-hmm. DCAU. He, there was a lot of Superman versus dark side, but then he plays such a big role later on coming in justice league unlimited and justice league. So we, we see him more as like the big baddie of the DC universe. This guy that we're going to talk about today is purebred Superman rogue and and completely and totally associated with Superman, especially Superman, the animated series. We've dragged it out long enough. Liam, we are, of course, uh, spotlighting Metallo. That's right. John Corbin himself this week and uh, his many appearances that didn't weren't just limited to Superman, the animated series, as we'll discuss today, but uh, many of his most notable ones certainly uh, were took place in Superman, the animated series, which is why we're talking about him this week during this uh, Superman month. 
Absolutely. Definitely. I think one of the uh, outside of the your Luthors and Brainiacs and Dark Sides, I think when you think of like the top tier villains of this, uh, this Superman rogues gallery, particularly in the DCAU, I think Metallo ranks right at the top there. And uh, so we will get into our character spotlight for Metallo uh, right here. And we will, of course, first mention his original first appearance, that being in Action Comics number 252 back in 1959. And he was created by Robert Bernstein, the writer, and Al Plastino, the artist. So uh, props to those men for it's just it's, it's one of those things where it's such a no-brainer for a concept, right? Mm -hmm. Evil robot, that's enough. But evil robot with brain of a man and a kryptonite heart like it's for what a, what a great foe for superman here <laughs> yeah i mean and, and it's interesting as we'll talk about later on maybe or actually now might be the the perfect time to talk about it but uh he has he's gone through a lot of different looks uh when it mm -hmm. comes to how he his persona in the comic books he's had He's been anything from a giant sort of behemoth of a robot to that, again, maybe closer to his first appearance was uh, a smaller human sized robot. We've seen how he looks in the DCAU, which was, you know, he started off as John Corbin and this uh, this gun for hire that was being used as sort of a a a, uh, a puppet by Lex Luthor, as we'll talk about in just a moment here, and then eventually is is uh, is turned into this. His brain is transported into this robot, so he gets the fake skin, and he kind of has almost a, a Harvey Dent Two Face type of look for a lot mm -hmm. of, of what we see him in Superman the Animated Series. That look was also translated into uh, into main continuity. I think most notably or or memorably for me uh would be in the superman batman public enemies uh ed mcginnis jeff loeb uh tremendous just uh, amazing story uh that uh from mm -hmm. from the late 2000s and uh just a that again was then later turned into an animated film so uh a, a, a tremendous piece of uh of of artwork there and, and a man at, or on a character that was really I mean, like you said, it's a no-brainer. It's a robot. Superman versus a robot is always going to be a story. So when you add in sort of the human element where he has a brain and his whole body is powered by the one element that can uh, kill Superman, yeah, that's a that's a that's a it's a formidable foe there, and one that whenever he goes up against Superman, you wonder about the Man of Steel's uh, you know viability to survive. So I, I think I think the creation uh, brilliant is certainly a word that I would use. Absolutely. So from there, we will look at all of his appearances on screen before uh, before the, no, looking at the end, we'll look at some of his action figure and uh, comic tie in appearances here in the DCAU. But we'll start out with uh, his first appearance being, of course, in the episode Last Son of Krypton Part 2. And then, of course, again, in Part 3, uh, the, the premiere episodes of Superman. So other than like I guess Brainiac and Lex are both in that episode. He's really, he's one of the first villains that our our DCAU Superman comes up against. Of course, uh, ending with that climactic battle in, in part three where he's, uh, where he's in the big Lexo 5000 robot suit and uh, he, he and Superman are fighting all through Metropolis. Yeah, and is that a little bit of foreshadowing there we have where John Corbin is inside a giant mm. robot for the majority of that episode or for the, for the majority of that third act of that episode, a little foreshadowing of what we would get where he would be essentially trapped inside a robot for the rest of his his uh his livelihood there i i don't know maybe but yeah it's uh, obviously it's not an official quote-unquote metallo appearance but it is john corbin and i think looking back at the way they chose to do things with him being again he's he's sort of used as a puppet uh by lex luthor in that episode the shady business dealings that lex is doing and he's using john corbin as the sort of uh as 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 cover for these dealings that he's doing with foreign governments and it's it's it's, it's just your tale is all this time for a kid's cartoon <laughs> where uh lex luthor pays mercenaries to steal his robot and sell it to a foreign government, uh, that being the mythical country of Kaznia. I said no interviews. What part of that don't you understand? Hans, Hans, there's no reason for hostility. 
especially towards such an attractive visitor. I'm John Corbin, special attaché to the Regent. How may I help you, miss? Lois Lane, Daily Planet. I'm doing a follow-up to a story on gun smuggling and was wondering if I could ask you some questions about your cargo. But we have no cargo. You must know there's a trade embargo between the U.S. and Kaznia. We're part of a diplomatic envoy trying to restore friendly relations between our countries. Then you won't mind me taking a look around. Better yet, why don't we continue this interview ashore, say, over dinner? I'd be more than happy to answer any questions that you might have. Uh, in order so that the U.S. government will come back to Lex to build him an even bigger and uh, build them an even bigger and better robot to uh, t to combat that one. So, you know, just your your garden variety uh, starting point for a for a for a Superman cartoon for sure. You gotta uh, but, love it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. As you said, it's not an official Metal episode, but yeah, that ending of uh you know superman's triumphant and he tears open the suit and uh and uh kind of lets uh lets corbin go off to the authorities and and then we see again what will become sort of a common theme uh which is of course the uh mr corbin being manipulated by lex as you said and we we see that in the very next episode that he appeared in which of course is the way of all flesh Last Son of Krypton, by the way, if you want to go back in the archives and hear our review of it way back there, as we said, episode 11 is when we covered that episode. Uh, if you want to hear our thoughts on that, well, we might revisit that one in the future with a, uh, mm -hmm. with a, with a re-review. But uh, if you want to hear our original thoughts and scores on that episode 11, Way of All Flesh, by the way, the very next episode, episode 12. True, we got right to it there. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so then we really, uh, we really hit the ground running here. We open. Uh, we have. Uh, we have. John Corbin is pretty much living the uh, as much of a luxury life as one could live in a prison, thanks to his uh, his refusal to give up Lex Luthor once he was arrested. So he's he's eating very well and and having a good uh, having a, a pretty good time of it. Uh, before suddenly uh, fe falling ill, and uh, in fact, he finds out that he has a incredibly rare uh, disease that is going to slowly but surely uh, spell the end of Mister Corbin. Uh, at which point, Lex and uh, and the uh, the doctor let let him know that there there may be an alternative treatment that can uh, that can not only save his life but to uh, but uh, can also uh, improve things. No one's been more loyal to me than you, John. You could have implicated me in the Lexo suit affair, but you didn't. And for that, I'm going to reward you. This sure doesn't feel like a reward, Luthor. It's the only way to save your life. You have to do it. Don't worry, you'll look exactly as you do now. But I'll be metal on the inside. Better than metal, metallo. A virtually indestructible alloy. That the kryptonite? The source of your power. And Superman's destruction. You want that, don't you? After what he did to you. What do I have to lose? <laughs> Indeed. Uh, he uh, he agrees to that, of course, but not really any other options on the table. And uh, when he when he is out and about later on, it's uh, it's clear that uh, Superman has a a new foe and that he's not quite the man he was before. Uh, we don't see the the dramatic transformation yet, although we are very quickly Superman is very quickly introduced to the fact that not only is John Corbin now super strong, almost as strong as Superman. But of course, we get the big reveal, the, the, the slot in the chest goes down, and he does in fact have a kryptonite heart, which is just, as we talked about, is a, a perfect foil for Superman, as Superman's barely able to get away with a little help from a distraction from Lois. But it's clear that uh, Metallo is going to be a, a force to be reckoned with here, and more importantly, during that battle, he... Uh, we we I, we neglected to mention this when talking about Last Son of Krypton, but there is a scene in part three where he uh, kidnaps Lois Lane, and uh, so he's sort of familiar with her. And he, uh, when he sees her trying to get involved, trying to keep Superman from uh, from an untimely demise, he uh, he tries to uh, steal a kiss, so to speak. Well, he doesn't try to; he does. 
and uh, he then sort of begins to realize what exactly this uh, operation, this life-saving operation has done to him as he realizes not only can he not feel pain, he can't really feel anything anymore. He's not going anywhere, Ms. Lane. Corbin. You remember me? Good. I've been thinking about you a lot, especially these last few months in prison. Corbin, if you so much as... I, 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 I didn't feel anything. See if you feel this. Ow! I, I can't even feel a kiss. What did they do to me? Yep. Uh, whew, man, what a, uh, what, what a uh, interesting way of thinking about how a, a man who, who is literally a robot, he can no longer feel anything you know he can't feel pain he cannot feel uh he cannot feel the force of uh, of superman's destructive punches he can absorb blows more than any normal human man he's pretty much indestructible but he as you mentioned that uh, caveat is is that he cannot taste anything there's a very interesting moment where he confronts lex after he realizes he you know, he can't taste anything, he can't feel anything. And after initially being promised by this doctor that performed the surgery that that would all come about, uh, he learns that that was that was all lies uh, in an attempt to, again, continually hold this control and manipulate him. And that's where the the crux of the episode, once he realizes and comes to, to Lex to sort of uh, to find out what's going on, to help him switch back or to get his get his old life back. And, and Lex basically tells them, tough luck. You're I I fooled you and I and uh, there's nothing else that you can do at this point. So it's at this point where we have the realization where where he has the realization that not only is Superman uh, someone that is going to be a, uh, a foe of his, but uh, he really has has no love loss at this point for Lex either, which leads to this interesting culmination of the episode on Lex's yacht in the middle of the Metropolis Harbor. That's right. So we yeah we have uh, we have Lex trying to reason with Corbin as he's seemingly there to uh, to, to exact revenge on Lex and telling him that perhaps they can they can find a new body or some way to uh, to fix his condition, trying anything to keep Corbin from uh, from snapping and ending it right there. At least he stalls long enough for Superman to arrive. And uh, at that point, of course, Metallo springs into action again. Seemingly, he has Superman dead to rights. But right when things look uh, quite dire for the Man of Steel, he's able to produce a little vial of this supposed virus that uh, Mr. Corbin had contracted that set all of these events in motion. And uh, he's, uh, he's informed that, in fact, the doctor who had, uh, who had told him about this great procedure, uh, in fact, had also directed the prison guards to lace Corbin's food, his fancy food that he was getting in prison, with this virus. Some enemy. Luthor's your enemy. He did this to you. Yes, he saved me from that virus. Otherwise, I'd be dead by now. Here's your virus. What's this? The doctor. Put it in your food. How else do you think you got such a rare disease? But why would he... Luthor told him to. The kryptonite's gotten to him. He's delirious. I'm not so sure of that. I'll be right back. Don't be a fool, Corbin. Don't you see? He's trying to turn us against each other to save his own skin. Who knows what's in that vial? Then why don't we test it? Corbin, no. No. Uh, at the behest, of course, of Lex Luthor, because this was always the plan, was to turn him into this killing machine. Uh, at which point Metallo breaks off from Superman and goes to confront Lex and, and uh, in fact, tries to make Lex drink this little vial of poison that Superman produced. And uh, Superman, sort of realizing that it's now or never, is able to, uh, to ignite some fuel uh, from these cans that had spilled and set off an explosion. Metallo and Lex go flying into the ocean 
and uh, and seemingly we see the end as it's made very clear, perhaps because he's too heavy. Uh, Metallo sinks and Lex is uh, quite smug about it as Superman takes him back to shore and, and informs Superman that there's simply no way this could be connected to him and that the only possible witness that could uh, that could testify against him is now deceased. Or, or is he, as we have maybe one of the coolest endings to any DCAU episode, as uh, we cut back to the, the you know miles under the ocean we sort of pan down to the ocean floor and we see a figure with a green glowing chest slowly walking on the ocean floor to let us know that the uh, the movie monster is coming back for a sequel yeah and the the accompanying and we'll talk about it in a little bit here uh the accompanying soundtrack to this the the iconic metallo theme plays Mm -hmm. and and we'll talk about how much of that adds to this character here in 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 our next segment once we get through his appearances here but boy when you get that that reveal of him still being alive he's coming back there to be continued he will our our monster will return like uh yeah it's just one of those moments in the in the series where you're like all right well we had to we had to believe that he wouldn't wouldn't stay dead it's too good to be true what's going to happen the next time he uh he goes toe-to-toe with superman and uh we uh we actually would see that in uh in in a few episodes later well chronologically so we ended up reviewing these episodes out of order (laughs) <laughs> but uh, we we ended up reviewing the next time we reviewed a, a Metallo episode was on episode 77, but it was out of order because uh, we don't review Superman episodes in order. So the next chronological appearance of him was actually on episode 167 of the podcast, uh, if you want to check that out. That's right. And it was the episode aptly titled Action Figures, where uh, most of it uh, takes place on this uh, this island outside of Metropolis where a volcano is about to go of off. Course. The volcanic yeah. island outside of Metropolis. <laughs> where else yeah. would it take place? It's, it's that, I wonder how close that is to the Gotham Desert. <laughs> um, is this also the same? Did we discuss, is this the same island where he sends Volcana to like after he... Oh takes volcano afterwards potentially is this uh is this the island where he fights doomsday eventually we don't know right we don't uh, know there 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 could be many volcanic islands in the DCA, <laughs> but here on this one we uh we meet a, a pair of children named bobby and sarita their dad being sort of the scientist who's studying the uh the volcanic eruptions and as as the uh they are sort of <laughs> Seem- seemingly days away from this volcano going off yet he still lets his children just <laughs> just meander off i'm telling you bonus ep- we we talked about it but seriously i think for father's day 2023 we should do a bonus episode of worst mm-hmm. dads of the dcau like a march madness style like <laughs> tournament bobby and sarita's dad definitely gets nominated for letting his children run around on an island that is knowingly he's this again he's the scientist knowingly uh letting his children run around this island by themselves uh, who also knows what type of wildlife or what have you would also be on this island but this knowing that this thing was days away or moments away from erupting uh at any moment here and still just unsupervised lets his children children run around and, and play without uh without him being around just great a terrible dad stuff yeah like there's multiple times in this episode where uh, we're getting off track of our metallo spotlight but yeah suffice to say there are multiple times in this episode where bobby and serena are in mortal danger <laughs> and a uh, one such example is when they are seemingly about to uh they uh they things are looking pretty dire for them but a, a mysterious metal man in a trench coat uh, protects them and saves their lives, uh, but interestingly enough, he uh, he does not have any memory of who he is. Though we will uh, we will obviously be able to tell from the green glowing eyes and the voice actor, who we will talk about in a little bit here. Uh, I think we, the audience, know who it is. But uh, if for some reason I guess you had missed the first uh, Metallo episode here, we kind of set it up to where our, he he is just sort of this friendly guardian angel and he doesn't quite remember anything that is of course until uh bobby and sarita make him like a little popsicle stick action figure of uh of superman at which point he sort of begins to remember and uh, as the uh, as the volcano begins to erupt 
uh, Bobby and Serena's dad suddenly realizes that they aren't uh, they aren't around. So uh, <laughs> Superman, as well as uh, as as well as Lois Lane, who has gone there after hearing reports of a mysterious metal man showing up on this island, she's also been there. And uh, when she, and right as Metallo has sort of captured Lois and is uh, preparing to uh, to uh, to maybe leave her, and also. Uh, very willing to leave the kids as well, even though they've been his new friends, uh, uh, leave her to die on the island. Superman arrives, but thankfully, knowing that Metallo could be in play here, he brings the old trusty anti-kryptonite suit, and, uh, <laughs> and they have a fight. But as is tradition for any episode featuring the anti-kryptonite suit, it has to immediately be rendered uh, unusable. Mm-hmm. So, in, in, that in, darn in, lava, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. At least, yeah, they have a pretty good reason here. Is yes, they have a fight. And uh, Superman is, uh, is is holding his own, but then of course the lava is, is uh, he's able to be sort of dunked into the lava by Metallo, and the the suit begins to melt away, allowing Metallo seemingly to to have him dead to rights again. He seemingly is going to let not only Superman but Lois and uh, and Bobby and Sarita all die. But Superman, thankfully, the the gloves, the lead gloves of his anti kryptonite suit have not melted off. So at the last second, he's able to reach in and pluck the kryptonite heart right out of Metallo's chest and throw it into the lava. With Metallo's trying in vain to rush after it before the uh, before the the robot shell powers down. Superman, of course, saves everybody, and uh, we seemingly once again have seen the end of Metallo. But just like the first episode, we do get a little a little postscript as we see uh, sort of the the aftermath of the eruption. The lava has sort of begun to harden, and we see this shell of Metallo with no heart sticking like halfway out of the lava. And we hear a little bit of a voiceover as uh, we hear his internal monologue telling him that he'll never forget again that he is Metallo. And that, that, that's sort of the refrain as we end our episode as I am Metallo over and over again as we fade to black, except for, of course, our little green glowing eye. So once again, we know Metallo is coming back on the scene. It's so still and dark. No sound. No light. Nothing. My mind. I cannot let it drift. I must remember. I am Metallo. I am Metallo. Yes, and thankfully so, because uh, again, we've already established he's a formidable foe. Anytime he goes up against Superman, you got to wonder about the uh, the safety of the man of tomorrow. And we would once again wonder about that safety. As I mentioned, uh, we uh, reviewed this next episode of, that he appeared in back on episode 77 of the podcast, but uh, that would be in the episode Heavy Metal which is uh, notable for quite a, uh, a, a, probably another giant metal man fighting in this episode. But uh, boy, howdy, what a, what a great and uh, memorable appearance for this one. It's, I think it's interesting because uh, a lot of the fighting uh, takes place not between Superman and Metallo, but uh, an alternate hero and Metallo. That's right. So we have, uh, we have just an, all-time great uh, and again we'll talk about music more in a couple minutes here but an all-time great reveal here i think for for a surprise villain appearance as superman and john henry irons who we had met in a previous episode along with his niece natasha are uh, are dealing with some inter-gang thugs in in the neighborhood and just as it seems like everything's been wrapped up thanks to superman's intervention uh, the last, the last uh, thug, last intervening thug proves to have uh, quite the left hook as he knocks Superman back and uh, slowly but surely rips off the shirt to reveal the metal chest, takes off the inner gang mask to reveal the, the half flesh face of Metallo. As uh, and he, he again, uh, we get a great line of uh, it's Metallo and he simply answers in the flesh. Hey, look! Time to throw in the old towel. You were just too much for us. Metallo. 
in the flesh. Mm-hmm. As, uh, as we go from there. And then as you mentioned, Cal, uh, because Superman is once again dealing with a, a kryptonite powered villain, one who has had some uh, pretty cool uh, physical improvements thanks to Intergang, including now he has kryptonite laser eyes in this episode. <laughs> uh, he, uh, yeah, that's, that's, that, it's a lot of fun, uh, a lot of fun action. It's a pretty action heavy episode, but of course what it really ends with is when the chips are down, Superman can't save the day. Who's going to step up to save the neighborhood? None other than John Henry Irons donning the costume and the armor of steel for the first time in the series. Of course, uh, you know, doing the DCAU version of the uh, the classic character that was introduced in the in the 90s comics. And uh, they he and Metallo have a, just a knockdown drag out battle. Superman tries to get back involved, but it still looks like Metallo is going to have him dead to rights. But thankfully, John Henry is there with the hammer and with the with the hammer that would make Thor with the hammer throw that would make Thor blush. <laughs> he hits he hits the perfect one in a million shot and uh, shatters the kryptonite heart of Metallo, sending him falling down uh, onto the street below. And uh, and the day is saved thanks to Superman's new uh, new partner in crime fighting, that being Steel. So not only do you get the return of Metallo, but of course you also get the introduction of Steel, who would return later on in Justice League. Um, so uh, as much as I'd like to say that's the last appearance of Metallo <laughs> in Superman the Animated Series, Cal, we got one more to go out on. And boy, this Metallo trilogy, these three we've just talked about, fantastic action figures is a little weaker i think you can you can go back and hear our full thoughts on that one but overall it would be like one of the stronger villain arcs throughout i think any of our series Mm -hmm. but it isn't just a trilogy (laughs) uh not only did he have his prequel appearances as john corbin and last son of krypton but metallo himself makes one last appearance in an episode (laughs) we talked about not too long ago uh that being superman's pal Yep, episode 196. So not that uh, not that long ago, unfortunately. Uh, <laughs> not long enough, certainly, in my, in my book. But boy, howdy, we talked about that enough on that episode. But we have this we have this entire shtick where Jimmy Olsen is uh, is given is given this like status as a as a popular figure in the city because thanks, he's thanks to uh, metropolis's true greatest villain angela chen <laughs> oh man that, that say what you want about the media but boy they can really ruin someone's life and <laughs> this isn't a great example of that here so yes we get uh, we get some fancy editing that turns uh, jimmy olsen into the most popular man uh human in in all of metropolis as he's suddenly known as superman's pal that uh, he and superman are buds and of course the the downside to this is that uh we we learn that jimmy quickly becomes a target uh has a target placed on his back from a lot of people that don't like superman so a lot of stuff happens with that there's also this love interest that he's interested in this new person that's working at the daily planet and he's trying to ask out on a date but she's out of his league and finally he gets up enough uh enough interest and now that he's kind of famous it seems like she's taken an interest in him as well and we uh they go on out out on a little date and she saves him from this mob that was trying to chase after him and brings him on a date to a uh, to a junkyard because she says she wants him to meet somebody and of course the big reveal is is that her real boyfriend is not uh, not Jimmy Olsen and she was never really romantically interested in him at all but was only using him to uh, to bring him to one Metallo who is revealed to be her actual boyfriend <laughs> My boyfriend Metallo. That would have been a, a better. I feel like that would have been a better title of this episode than Superman's pal. But I digress. But uh, yeah, we get uh, basically Jimmy is used as bait by Metallo in an attempt to lure Superman to this mm-hmm. junkyard so that they can have a fight. And uh, we we get uh, we get Metallo bested by two two classic elements here. He's bested by a giant magnet, and then uh, bested by uh, battery acid. So not uh, not uh, not not Metallo's most memorable way of being defeated. But uh, he mm-hmm. seemingly has Superman dead to rights, and 
Uh, Jimmy Olsen looks around, finds a, a d- eroding battery and sort of flings battery acid onto the, the chest of Metallo that just happens to land in the right spot to melt the wires that are connected to the kryptonite heart. Thus, uh, this leaving the uh, kryptonite heart to melt out of him, fall out of him, hit his suit to power down and to be c- collapsed under a bunch of cars. So uh, not Metallo's finest hour, I'll say that. <laughs> Yeah, no one, no one involved with the, the making of that episode. I think uh, looks back fondly on it, and uh, <laughs> we we did not either when we uh, when we reviewed it. Certainly, I will just say I think back when we reviewed the the great episode, uh, Terry's friend dates a robot. Of course, Batman Beyond. I did suggest the alternate title for this episode being uh, Superman's friend dates a girl who dates a robot. Uh, absolutely, it would have been a. a a much better and much more uh, stomachable uh, episode title than, than what we ended <laughs> Would have been the best thing about the episode. <laughs> Absolutely, 100%. But uh, unfortunately, that is the end of, uh, of Metallo's appearance. It's a real sour note to go out on. Um, but before we get to his sort of minor appearances in, uh, in other DCAU cartoons, probably a good point here, Cal, to look at uh, probably the other two defining characteristics other than the visuals, a great character design and uh, a great villain, as we talked about. But what really brings this to life is two things that, of course, being the, the, our other categories that we talk about when we review these shows every week, uh, the voice acting and, of course, the music. And uh, I think we could start with uh, the music here and just mention that uh, the, the music done for the episode Way of All Flesh, which then is brought back quite often in his future appearances, uh, was done by the great Lolita Ritmanis. And man, if that Metallo theme isn't just like just top tier, S tier uh, villain music for uh, for the DCAU here. Yeah, I, I think. And that's another in the future bonus episode that we have to talk about, you know, the best themes of the mm-hmm, DCAU. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, this is this is upper echelon top 10, maybe top five, maybe top three. Like you got to it's it's. I mean, especially when it comes to villain villain themes, when you break it down even further, boy, uh, it doesn't get much more memorable, menacing. It's, you know, there's a a little bit of jaws to it. Like, you know, the, the, the anticipation, you see this, this uh, threat coming, you know what it means, you know what this threat means for Superman. Um, The, 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 the strings that just continually build the tension and you get some, you know, you get some, uh, some, some horns playing in the back and then maybe some xylophone here and there. And, you know, the drums come in a little bit. It's, it's a, it's an orchestral masterpiece in my humble opinion. And uh, boy, it, it, it takes this character who we already said, it's a great idea. He's a formidable foe for, uh, for Superman to face based on the, the characteristics. It's a robot. It's a kryptonite powered robot uh, at that. So it's, there's already some tension there, but boy, this just, it just, I, from the time that this character debuted, I can remember playing with our action figures and mimicking mm-hmm. the soundtrack to this for this character as we're playing. Like you, it's it's just synonymous with this character. Absolutely, uh, what a what a tremendous piece of of music by by Miss R- R- Ritmanis. And boy, um, you know, it it just took that character from from an already high level based on what we know about him to to just you know the stratosphere. What you're talking about uh memor uh memorable moments and and just uh the impact of the character the tension you're creating in the the scenes between him and superman uh just just great great a stuff can't say enough good things about it yeah it's got it's just got this it's just so relentless it feels like we i mean we kind of talked about like the the horror movie villain qualities of of his appearances but there is that feeling where Superman whenever this guy's around Superman's just got to get away because he's not safe and that theme coming up just sounds like it sounds like footsteps almost like someone's Mm -hmm. just marching towards you constantly as this unrelenting force and Mm -hmm. yeah it's just a brilliant brilliant piece of music and I always love those those villain themes that get sort of uh, brought back throughout the series and and that one by Miss Romanis is is as you said Cal really one of the best of uh, of certainly of this series and probably of the entire DCAU 
Uh, but uh, that will bring us to, of course, his voice actor for all of his Superman the Animated Series uh, appearances. That being, of course, the great Malcolm McDowell, who folks would know from things like uh, Star Trek, and uh, I believe he was in the Star Trek Generations movie, which is the, the one where Patrick Stewart and William Shatner team up. Gotcha. And, uh, and then, of course, he was also in A Clockwork Orange, has done tons of other stage work, a lot of other voice acting work. But man, like what a picture perfect uh, voice for, for this character, because there's there's such a dramatic sort of, again, old school, like, like, fifth, you know, like 40s body horror sci fi to him. And to have, as, you know, as as was often the case when uh, when Andrea Armano was doing the voice casting, she would look to you know, not necessarily voice actors, but to people who were just good actors. And a lot of times she would look to stage actors and Metallo has a very dramatic way of speaking. And that's obviously coming from, uh, from Mr. McDowell and, and the way he sort of brings the character to life with, uh, with Andrea Romano's direction. He, he's, he just has this real, it's very theatrical, but he never loses like the sinister edge that makes him feel scary at the same time. Absolutely. There's a there's a cockiness to the way that he talks, you know, think about the the different reveals that he has. Um, I love I love when he's talking to Lois and he calls her Miss Lane. Like mm -hmm. there's there's like a, a sarcastic respect that he has for her um, and the way that he delivers that. It, it's just so great. So, you know, so much of it, some of it may have been the lines that he was given and what was written for him. But I think with with any other it's hard to picture any other voice for that character as you said it's just it's sinister but there's so much emotion that's delivered from this robot <laughs> you know how do you mm -hmm. how do you give emotion to a robotic character well you have to have a dynamic voice actor uh, especially if the if the if you're not giving like facial uh, emotions to the character like he doesn't emote anything his eyes don't change really uh, unless he has his his skin on you can kind of see some some emotion that way but a lot of it is coming through this theatrical uh, way of, of the lines being delivered and Mr. McDowell is I mean he's a he's he's just a, a legendary stage actor and so much of stage acting is being the character and being physical with your arms and delivering you know and in, mm -hmm. in those over the top uh, productions uh it's so much of that can be can be visual along with your voice so i can just picture him in the studio you know moving his arms and stuff like that as he's delivering these lines but it comes it doesn't ever veer into uh saturday morning cartoon villainy mm -hmm. of of a skeletor that we that we talk about you know you you teeter on those lines when you have somebody that is a a stage actor that tends to be more dramatic in the way that they deliver things um there's no hint of irony in the way that he delivers them and we we said that about so many different dcau voice actors but mr mcdowell specifically in this case i think just nailed that so well and being able to be dramatic but to also take it seriously in the way that he delivers it. You can feel the emotion when he's frustrated with Lex of not being realizing he's never going to be able to taste food again or, or feel the touch, mm -hmm. you know, of a, of another human being again, that this is, he's trapped in this body forever. Like, um, you know, you, you almost have some empathy and some sadness for him as he comes to this realization. And so much of that is from the performance that Mr. McDowell is able to give this character. Um, and as you mentioned, you know, the sinister, the sinister one liners and the, the just the, the utter hatred that he has for Superman and this this, uh, you know, revi reviling him so much and wanting wanting to destroy him. Uh, you know, so much of that is is given in that voice acting. So, yeah, uh, uh, another another home run <laughs> uh, casting there by Andrea Romano. But uh, yet yeah, so much of that performance uh, also makes up that character. It's everything. It's the it's the design of the character. It's the the music. And I think if you take the voice, the voice actor, if you take Mr. McDowell away, there's no way that these episodes are as memorable or this character as is as memorable to his Superman appearances. So yeah, another, another great casting and another reason why this character is so memorable for this, this run. Yeah, absolutely. Like I said, it's just the, the there's, he's a, he's just a true villain through and through. And, 
and it was just a, a brilliant piece of casting, of course, by the great Andrea Romano. And uh, that would uh, that would wrap up his Superman appearances. As mentioned, we do get a few uh, minor appearances throughout Justice League and Justice League Unlimited. He is uh, part of that uh, sort of Superman revenge squad that we see in uh, here after part one. Um, kind of a minor player there, but in that case, he's actually voiced by uh, by Corey Burton, of course, the uh, legendary voice actor, most most famously in Superman, of course, voices Brainiac, but that's about a billion other voices as well throughout uh, throughout each cartoon that he appears in. But uh, we do have him as part of that group with Toy Man and Livewire, Weather Wizard. Uh, it, was, it was fun to see all of those uh, Superman the Animated Series villains pop back up here to uh, to fight with not just Superman, but the whole Justice League. And uh, we don't really get much follow-up for him in that episode, obviously. And yeah, Liam, that episode, if you do want to uh, to check out Hereafter, uh, we, have, we reviewed that way back on episode 63 of the podcast. Um, nothing wrong with, uh, with Mr. Burton's performance, I think, from my memory in that episode, but it did feel a little bit alien. You know, it mm-hmm. feels... Uh, pun intended, you know, with the Brainiac voice being subbed there. Like it just, <laughs> it just didn't, when you have somebody that's so iconic as Mr. McDowell was, uh, is, you know, it's, it's hard to switch that. And Corey Burton is, is, you know, tremendous in his own right and, and iconic in his own right uh, when it comes to voice acting and especially the DCAU, but it just, it just wasn't the same. It didn't quite feel the same. Felt like a, an out of body experience, uh, pun intended. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. And then uh, from there, that would not be the last time we saw Metallo as like with uh, pretty much every other villain that they they had that uh, they were allowed to use at this point. In that final season of Justice League Unlimited, he was part of the 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 new secret society, aka the uh, the the DCA used version of the Legion of Doom. And, and we sort of see him in the background a few times in, in I am Legion, as well as to another shore. And then uh, he takes a little bit more of a starring role with uh, with Mr. Malcolm McDowell returning to the role in the episode Chaos at the Earth's Core, which is sort of mostly a, a sort of Stargirl and Supergirl focused episode, as well as introducing uh, the characters of Scar Terrace and, uh, and Warlord. But uh, still fun to have him back in that brief role. Obviously, we have not covered any of those uh, last season JLU episodes as as we're kind of taking our time and in, uh, in the way we review those, but uh, but yeah, it was it was fun to get him back for that one last appearance, even if it's in sort of a minor role. As we sort of do that, that whole season is sort of the big setup of all of these villains appearing in random places to uh, to attack the Justice League's allies, and and they the Justice League sort of slowly putting together the puzzle that there's a a larger network of villainy going on. Yeah, it's it's certainly an, an interesting uh, it's certainly an interesting uh, episode. I think we talked about this when we were kind of preparing for this this uh, <laughs> preparing for this this uh, episode, and I I don't think I've I don't think I've watched that one too many times the, uh, <laughs> the last appearance so uh when we do get to that it'll be a nice ref- it'll be almost like i watched a brand new episode uh, <laughs> before because there's very little that i remember about it um and and how and uh, honestly if you had told me that there was a an episode that there wasn't another episode with metallo in it i, I probably would have believed you <laughs> so uh, <laughs> so we'll see maybe that doesn't reflect on how i feel about the episode just that it's i haven't seen it very often so uh, hard, hard to hard to comment on the things that I, I haven't seen in some time or, or that and that aren't that memorable. But I have no doubt that uh, once we get to that episode, we'll have we'll have plenty of things to say about it. Absolutely. But that does wrap up Metallo's on screen appearances. Uh, again, I think going back and realizing that he had those appearances later on in JLU, he has more more on screen appearances than you might think. But uh, that does wrap them up here. And before we'll wrap up, we will take uh, a look a little bit at a few of his uh, his appearances in in merchandise and as well as uh, his appearances in the Superman Adventures tie in books. Uh, but we'll start with his uh, his action figures here. He's uh, he's one of the rare Superman villains who got a figure in that original Superman, the animated series, Kenner line as uh, although nonsensically, he does come with like a hover bike that, <laughs> that he rides on. And so his hands are shaped like, you know, like he's like he's riding a motorcycle. So his uh, his posing is kind of strange, but it was cool to get a villain in a line that was uh, a little light on the uh, on the Superman, the animated series villains. 
Yeah, that's uh, and as was the case with most of those uh, most of those releases, you know, it's interesting looking back. Things have changed. Uh, I think in the toy industry, they definitely have changed in the toy industry. <laughs> looking back at, at that that period of time, uh, for some reason, villains and female action figures were usually packed uh, less to a case. So you might have a an eight eight figures in a case and you would have uh, two of the same, you know, two of each say there's, you know, three Superman figures in that, in that series, you'd have two of each of those Superman figures. And then you'd have one villain and one, if there's a female action figure at all, or there might be two, two of the villain or whatever. So Mm -hmm. those, the villains and the, 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 the female figures, because executives thought that kids didn't care about them or wouldn't buy them, um, were, were packed less. So they were harder to find, you know, scalpers or, coll- or people that were collecting them at the time, comic book stores would buy them up and, and sell them for, for markup prices. And uh, so, yeah, I, I don't ever remember seeing the single release in the, in the store. We didn't, we didn't actually get it into our own collection until uh, Hasbro did a re-release of that figure in a, uh, in a four pack later on. Um, and uh, we were able to obtain it, obtain it then. But uh, it was it's an interesting figure. I think that it, it certainly isn't doesn't benefit from having the the motorcycle grip hands. You know, it's a, <laughs> it's a five point of articulation action figure from the from the mid '90s. So you're kind of stuck with what you're doing there. It's kind of sitting in this weird pose. But I do think it's interesting that they made the functionality of the of the uh, the kryptonite chest plate to yes. to slide down. Uh, there's a little button that you press on the back that sort of pushes the piece of kryptonite forward to knock down the uh, the little swinging door. So while it doesn't slide to the side like it would on the show, you did have the option of the the the, the kryptonite being covered and and then the reveal afterwards as as you could play out. So uh, for that for the time, I think that was a pretty neat neat function of the action figure. The likeness is. Is pretty close to what we see on the uh, on the episode, stylized stylized a little bit for for action figure purposes, a little bit more muscular. But uh, you know that that was the case with those figures. So it's a it's a fine action figure. Uh, and when when you didn't have that many villains uh, figures to begin with for the series, you know it's it was nice to finally get that one added to the collection and be able to play out those uh, Superman versus Metallo battles that you wanted to mimic. Absolutely. Sadly, we never got a steal, so we couldn't really. Yep. You, had to, you had to sub in the the '90s Death of Superman or Reign of the Superman steal for that, which right. didn't quite work. But hey, you had that, and then that Metallo was re-released once uh, Hasbro had uh, had bought out Kenner, uh, we, which I think is how we got the figure. Actually, uh, Sans mm-hmm. his uh, his hover bike Metallo was included in the Superheroes versus Supervillains four pack which had Superman, Supergirl, and then Bizarro along with Metallo, which was a cool set because that, those four packs, you mentioned how, how tough to find a lot of those villain figures were. So these, uh, these sort of late life uh, Hasbro re-releases were a good way for, for, for folks like us to, uh, to recollect or collect for the first time, some of these characters that had not uh, had sort of eluded us for, uh, from our, from our earlier collecting days. Yeah, they were. I mean, it was it was a little price prohibitive because I remember I think they were Toys R Us exclusives and you'd go in and I think they were either they might have been 25, 30 bucks at the time. So this was, mm-hmm. uh, you know, early 2000s, probably. So that's, you know, it was a little expensive at the time, especially if you're a kid, like, you know, convincing convincing parents or grandparents to, to purchase a, a thirty dollar set of action figures is a. Uh, you know, they don't look at the value. You're getting four figures for that price. They just see the price tag and they're like, ah, maybe. Mm-hmm. But uh, you know, it it's uh it was nice, as you said, it was a nice option. It was it was great that they thought to do that. Sometimes the, the figures would get repainted, as we'll talk about uh, at some point when we go through uh talking about these figures in long form. But yes, it was uh it was definitely nice to finally add that to our collection. Absolutely. 
And then uh, that would not be his last appearance in plastic form, uh, at least in the DCAU version, as I uh, think kind of later in the run there, uh, the Mattel Justice League Unlimited three packs that were coming out. They did a lot of a lot of characters, but uh, thanks to the Mattel JLU fan collection, we got a three pack with uh, Metallo, Silver Banshee, who he was sort of paired with in that aforementioned chaos at the Earth's core episode. And of course, who else but Superman himself there. So uh, as Mattel was, as that Mattel JLU line somehow managed to live on for years and years, even after it was no longer uh, a mass retail product, uh, we still kind of got to round out that line with a lot of extra cool figures, uh, Metallo being among them. Yeah, absolutely. That, I mean, I think that set of figures, you could probably put that up against maybe any any series of action figures. I think that it's not appreciated yet because, oh, we're coming up on 20 years. There's this uh, rule in the toy collecting community that once you hit 30 years, uh, you know, things become a little bit more appreciated. Those figures obviously were coming out well after the show is off the air. So, you know, it's going to be quite a few years before we get to that mark. But that series, looking back at it, the amount of characters they got out and were able to to put in into action figure form is mm-hmm. un, unrivaled. It was the most complete DCAU set to date. Um and it's it, that the Metallo figure is is spot on. It's a great representation of the of of his character form in the DCAU, updated a little bit for the Justice League. Uh, but yeah, that 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 was a a, a nice nice uh, nice figure to get into that collection. It's I think it's all new parts because you have you have different aspects of the figure. Maybe the legs were reused, but uh, a lot a lot of it is new parts because of who Metallo is. So it was mm-hmm. uh, it was a pretty unique figure to have in your collection, and certainly much needed when you have already have a parasite. You have a a live wire figure mm-hmm. there. You, you you already are building out that Superman villains uh set there so to to put be able to put metallo in that group as we said with those those larger names and more recognizable superman rogues uh it was great to finally get him in that set as well absolutely and uh, from the world of toys and merchandise we move to our, our last little category here which is his tie-in comic appearances and metallo unsurprisingly across the issues of Superman Adventures, the tie-in for Superman the Animated Series had quite a few appearances, but I thought we could highlight just four uh, real quick, real quick here as we wrap up. First off, we have Superman Adventures number two, almost right out of the gate. We have, uh, we have uh, Metallo there uh, in an issue written by Scott McCloud and with pencils by Rick Burchett. Uh, we have the story of like a, a woman who's just kind of, it's kind of the inverted Superman's pal. <laughs> where, a, where a woman just starts claiming to be Superman's girlfriend and uh, much much to Superman's chagrin. And uh, that, of course, draws the attention of a, of, of a of particular villain who wants to try to draw Superman out. And in that case, it's Metallo. But maybe the highlight, if the issue itself is, is, is fun and, and fine, but probably the, it might be the most iconic, uh, one of the more iconic Superman Adventures covers which is just this image of uh, Metallo standing on a looks, looks like the arch of a bridge, firing those kryptonite uh, beams at Superman as he sort of has this this uh, this damsel in distress in one arm, and he's firing the kryptonite blast at Superman, who's sort of flying backwards toward us. Yeah, it's a it's a great piece of art. I believe uh, Mr. Burchett is is the artist. Uh, along with Terry Austin and Marie Severin for that cover. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, it's a, uh, it's a, it's one of those ones where you had the, I think the initial issue Superman number one was a Bruce Tim cover. So uh, coming mm-hmm. out of the gate with a, with a very strong image of Superman with these guns shooting at him. So then your very next issue in your collection is this shot of Superman, you know, it middle of the sky sort of falling, falling to earth as, as a uh, Metallo sort of triumphantly raises his arm up and holds this mysterious woman. It's a, it's a good, it's a good shot of like, eye-catching artwork to say what what's going on here what's happening in this Mm -hmm. year um and it also gives you the preview that all right well this is clearly dcau related because this is this is the this is the metallo that i know from the the animated series that i'm watching i got to find out what's going on in this issue so yeah the the cover is definitely i think the highlight 
the story is is perfectly okay as well but i i think the the cover is certainly memorable enough it's a uh, it's a great little shot there absolutely and then we move ahead from there cal to superman adventures number 27 uh most fascinating to me and this is kind of something that i think is probably forgotten because of what the uh, the writer of this book went on to do, but uh, Mark Miller or Mark Millar, as he might be known, uh, depending on your pronunciation, who of course you know created Kick Ass and has this you know giant Netflix deal, you know has his own universe of characters, the Millerverse, uh, that has all these properties in it. Uh, had a pretty long run as a writer on Superman Adventures here. And uh, he, he was the writer on here, as we had Allure Amancio uh, as the artist for Superman Adventures number 27, which uh, is more of a Lex Luthor story of we see some flashbacks to his childhood of, you know, of, uh, of Lex. And we, we kind of get a little bit of an examination of why exactly it is that Lex is so threatened and so frustrated by Superman. And uh, to try to combat that, he uh, Lex introduces a, a LexCorp back superhero called Superior Man, <laughs> who is uh, who is Superman, who you know is very similar to Superman, but has sort of white hair and and uh, and, uh, and sort of the inverse color scheme of a costume. And uh, as as things seem to be going well with Superior Man uh, taking a lot of glory and a lot of press attention away from Superman. Uh, as, uh, as as Superman sort of confronts this superior man, it's revealed, of course, that underneath that costume is none other than Metallo, who has been brainwashed. And Superman is once again tasked with having to save Alexa's life from a vengeful Metallo, uh, just as we saw in the series. So a fun issue and a kind of a fun trivia note to, to point out that like a, a legitimate uh, you know, comic book writing legend in Mark Miller uh, wrote, wrote a couple issues here of, uh, of this DCAU tie-in book for Superman. Yeah, absolutely. It's, uh, as, as you said, a, a legendary writer uh, responsible for this fun little story that involves Lex brainwashing Metallo. And, uh, you know, it do, we don't get the reveal for Metallo. It's almost pretty much the third act and it's sort of a surprise. And then it's Superman is sort of forced to save Lex from Metallo. So uh, we it's it's certainly an interesting dynamic there. We get more of, of just how evil Lex is and how willing to just use and abuse people. Um, mm-hmm. it, it, it adds to that further development, even with the, the backstory of his childhood uh, sort of uh, as the thread that goes throughout the, the issue. But uh, oh, a, a great a great little story there. One that's, uh, that's fun. And I, I remember on the original read throughs, uh, uh, one that I enjoyed uh, quite a lot. So definitely worth, uh, worth checking out, by the way, all these, uh, all of these issues are available in the wonderful DC universe app. So, uh, it's, it's a great application. You know? It sure is. You know, we, we can't say it enough. It's a, it's just a great app. Check it out. Uh, you get the full run of all pretty much every DCAU tie-in comic is available on that, that, uh, that service. So if you want to want to catch up on them, uh, do so, uh, do so there. Absolutely. And uh, from there, we'll move on just a few issues forward. This is a minor appearance, but uh, in Superman adventures 31 uh, also written by Mark Miller and uh, with uh, art by Allura Mancio, you had, uh, you had this, story of these like alternate universe kryptonians uh, of lara uh kara and uh, and superman taking over earth and uh, while superman is trapped on their earth uh, or their krypton i should say uh and and trying to get back to his world to save the day in the meantime uh, some unlikely heroes step up not only lex but uh parasite bizarro and Metallo uh, stand up to these evil Kryptonians, and we get some uh, a pretty fun fight between them before they are ultimately defeated. Um, thanks to what is a, a now, uh, I guess, not, not canon uh, reason being that Supergirl not being from Krypton, she's not affected by Kryptonite. But uh, just a fun little small appearance from Metallo there, seeing him become like a, the resistance freedom fighter against these evil Kryptonians. That's a fun appearance there. Yeah, and uh, I I I love that. I love any time that you see like a a villain forced to turn good just for the sake of uh, not being taken over by a uh, a fascist regime. So you gotta you gotta love that. That even villains uh, in the DCAU have their limit of what they're uh, <laughs> what they're willing to take as far as evil is concerned. So 
you got gotta love that anytime that uh, a, a villain turns t- turns good albeit uh, for a limited amount of time that's right and then we had uh, sort of metallo's final big appearance in superman adventures all the way forward in superman adventures number 62 uh which was written by michael reeves and uh with pencils by neil vokes uh it's a it's an interesting issue they kind of actually again go back to the idea of metallo being uh being unable to feel and he's actually sort of through some sort of wild pseudoscience he's actually granted the ability to feel even in his metal form and as well as uh, his kryptonite is no longer stopped by lead so it's sort of uh, once again being manipulated by lex but he, uh, he he seemingly for a short period of time is able to to uh, gain uh, you know have his cake and eat it too there but uh, thanks to some help from professor hamilton superman is able to uh, to finally stand up and uh, and defeat him in the end and uh, not only give metallo his uh, his just desserts but lex his as well so it's a wacky little issue superman gets like an alternate anti-kryptonite suit <laughs> which i think is uh, is kind of fun but uh, you know it i do like that these comic book stories did something that the the show never did which is really go back to that that lex and metallo dynamic right um which was so so interesting in in that in you know his pre-metallo appearances and last son of krypton and then of course in way of all flesh that that finale it feels like he should be coming back after lex but we we never really got to see that that story told on the screen but thankfully we did get to see it uh readdressed and revisited in these uh these tie-in comics which as we've talked about before it was a lot of the fun of these uh these tie-in books over the years is just seeing stories and characters expanded upon that maybe they the show creators didn't have time or, or interest in revisiting and and uh pun very much intended fleshing them out a little bit more <laughs> yeah uh we we've you know you can it's hard i know for some people because they look at the, the comics and they say well they're not canon they don't work with the timelines they don't work with you know what happens on screen and um you know i i, I that's your opinion then good good I, I i welcome it and that's your opinion and I, I think that you're that's fine if that is your opinion um but i think there's there are so many great stories that were told by these other writers that have value and should can be appreciated um and we've talked about it when we've done our bonus episodes covering tie-in comics and you know the the the, the mindset of whether or not it's it it fits into the actual DCAU universe. It really doesn't matter. It's, 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 you're using the same characters. It's usually the same art style or a similar art style. You can use your imagination and decide yourself whether or not it fits into the, to the, the, the universe as a whole and it's canon or not, but you miss out on the enjoyment. I think if you, if that's your main focus and there's so many of these stories, there were 66 episodes of Superman, Superman adventures. So many of them likely contradicted stuff that you saw on screen then, or later on in justice league or justice league unlimited or Batman beyond. But as you mentioned, one of the most prolific and well, well-known writers uh, in the last 20, 30 years was, was writing these stories on a monthly basis. So there, there's still value there. There's still enjoyment to be had. So definitely uh, it, advise if you haven't checked out some of those, those tie-in comics, if you haven't ever read some of these Superman, the, uh, the animated series tie-in comics, Superman adventures, check it out, whether you're reading it digitally or maybe, you know, your local comic book shop has uh, some back issues that uh, are, are affordable, you know, check them out give them a read and uh, just kind of enjoy them for what they are, you know, cause they're uh, they, a lot of them are are enjoyable, great pieces of writing that uh, that you would otherwise miss out on, and and you get to spend a little extra time here in a in a DCAU uh, style. We'll say that. Absolutely, and thank you everybody for listening. That will begin to wrap us up for this week. Cal I had a lot of fun revisiting. Uh, some of these great Metallo appearances from across Superman the Animated Series and beyond. Uh, it was uh, like we said, we're, we're running out of regular uh, Superman episodes to review. So finding ways to revisit some of these ones we've reviewed in full and uh, go down memory lane that way is a lot of fun here. 
And uh, thank you everybody for listening, whether you do so on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or if you're listening on youtube.com slash the pod tower, the pod tower is where you can find not just our show, but also uh, shows from Watchtower Database as well, as well as uh, the whole back catalog of Tim Talk episodes. So please go ahead and subscribe to us at youtube.com slash the pod tower. If you haven't already, um, if you'd like to support the podcast, please feel free to do so. There's a couple of ways you can do that. One is by going right to our main site at anchor.fm slash DCAU. There's actually DCAU review. And there is actually a donate button there. If you're uh, so kind as to do so. Uh, you could also go to dcaureview.com and we have a shop there and uh, you can pick yourself up a hat or a mug or a, uh, or a t-shirt or something if you would like to get something back for your, uh, for your cheddar. And uh, a free way that you can help us out, Cal, is to, uh, to just leave a review or, uh, or, and, and give us five stars on the podcast app of your choosing. Or if, in fact, you are listening on the Pod Tower on YouTube, you know, like the video, subscribe, share the links, all that good stuff. That's a great way to help us out as well. So, uh, yeah, we had, a, we had a lot of fun, Cal, uh, this month in Metropolis. But uh, December, I think, is going to be a little bit of a hybrid month. But at least for the first couple of weeks, I think we're heading back to the sunny skies of Dakota for a couple of weeks here. That's right. We spent so many weeks here in sunny skies in Metropolis. Let's keep that sun shining. It's cold. It's it's you know here in the here in the eastern side of the U.S. You know where it's the cold months are are coming, and it's just it's it's not going to be fun. So we need a little bit of sun. We need a little bit of of warmth to to brighten things up. And why not uh, head to to Dakota, whatever that mythical city of Dakota is, as uh, as we check out uh, some more episodes of Static Shock coming next month. As we as you mentioned, it will not be a full month of Static Shock. We'll have a couple of those. But Static is uh, Static's about to be, get very popular again. I feel not only you know we have the the Static movie that's uh, in development, but uh, DC is doing something huge uh, with milestone characters and and celebrating a, a huge anniversary with them. And we have the the Static Beyond comic that is uh, it feels like we're getting new images released every single day mm-hmm. uh, in the DC continuity, which is going to be you know Static and Batman Beyond together. Uh, it's uh, it's it's an exciting time, especially if you have near and dear memories. Uh, linked to this this cartoon and or maybe you you haven't maybe you haven't given this cartoon a chance lots of people haven't this might be an opportunity for you to to check it out uh, brush up on some of your static uh, background knowledge and uh, and learn learn about the hero that's probably going to take a, a front seat and and be uh, hopefully on a lot of people's uh, radar here in the next uh, in the next several months and years that's right, Cal, and we will be kicking things off with our latest day in Dakota next week with a review of a season two episode, and that being uh, one, might be like the first or second episode of Static I think we ever saw, uh, that being titled Brother Sister Act. Uh, excited to check that one out. It's been quite some time since we've seen it. Uh, we'll check that out. It's going to be awesome. Absolutely, Cal, but until then, I'm Liam. And I'm Cal. And we'll be back soon with another episode of the DCAU Review. Merry Thanksgiving.